What's up? Happy Easter, everybody. Welcome all our campuses. So glad to be together today. We are multiple campuses all united today, uh, and not only in English, but tonight we start for the first time our Spanish services. Pretty exciting. Can't wait to do that today. But you know what's really exciting as well? We exist with one mission. There's a unified mission wherever you're joining us from today. We pray, we hope, we do everything we do so that you would experience life in God, so that you would find that God loves you, that he is after you, and that there is life available for those of us that seek him. That's our prayer for you, whether you're joining in Sunnyvale, Fremont, San Jose, maybe you're here exploring the claims of Jesus and trying to figure out what is this all about that people celebrate all over the world, or you're here to celebrate the fact that Jesus has changed your life, and so resurrection or Easter Sunday is meaningful to you. We've been praying that you would deepen real life inside your heart. But what is real life, by the way? What, what does it mean to have our hearts come fully alive? All these longings that we have inside of us, every single human being on earth has a longing for real life. So we wake up in the morning and we're like, we want our work to count. We want to be able to have joy and peace and have, be able to find life that's exciting to live. That is what we long for and the reason we long for it is because our creator put that longing inside of us so that we can find its fulfillment in him. But what happens often is that culture teaches us where to find these longings, but it leads us in a way that leaves us kind of empty still after pursuing them. In fact, right now, culture teaches us that to find real life, you have to look inside. So you just look inside yourself, you're like, maybe if you just search deep enough, you will find the answer right there inside your heart. So keep looking. And so what we've done because of that is we've designed a selfie-centric society where before we used to take pictures of the outside, now we've turned the cameras to ourselves. We've created a $590 million industry in selfie sticks, for example, and we've turned everything inward so that we would try to find inside of ourselves something that would just fulfill me. So they say to us, build your name, build your career, figure out your destiny, be in charge of your own you know, identity, whatever it might be that you're like, they, they say, just look inward for the answer. But if we're truthful, we're not really finding the right answer because the results right now in culture are not very good. In fact, statistics show right now, the data shows that 36% of us, even right here, that are joining at Echo Church in all of America, 36% live with ongoing feelings of isolation, loneliness, and a longing to be loved and to love that is unfulfilled. So as you look around, maybe look to your right, look to your left, whatever campus you're in, it's pretty likely that one or maybe even two out of you three are currently feeling this way. Like people might not know it from the outside, but inside there's an emptiness that you've been trying to fill. See, over half of marriages that start with happiness end in heartbreaking divorce. Most young people today feel totally disconnected even though we live in the most technologically connected generation of all time. Most young professionals or professionals in general that go to work don't feel like their work is connected to their purpose and they have a sense of emptiness with their careers. Most people are feeling, are living with this sense of emptiness even though we are obsessed with me, with looking inward. So 51% of Gen Z right now says that their ultimate goal in life is to find happiness. Like we're on a journey to figure this out. But at some point, we have to come to grips with ourselves in realizing that our approach is just not working. So I remember earlier in my life, I struggled with a lot of addiction. So I was addicted to pornography, first of all, that was killing me from the inside out. And I didn't know how to overcome it. I would try to stop and it would not stop. I was addicted to drugs, to drug use. And I tried over and over again to stop, and it was really hard for me to stop. And I was addicted to deception, pretending to be someone I'm not, 
And that was my lifestyle. And I remember trying and trying and trying and trying and waking up in the morning and saying, okay, I'm not going to do it today. I'm not going to do it today. And repeating over and over again. Sometimes it goes seasons, but then I go right back to it. And I had to come to the realization that my approach was just not working. I wonder what is in your past or in your present that you want to make sure does not make it into your future today. That when you think about your life, maybe something you're experiencing even now in the room, there's like a pain, a hurt, a wound, a shame, guilt. Maybe there's something you're carrying that you're like, I, I don't want that that's in my present or my past to make it to my future. And if I have a choice today, I want to leave it right here where I'm at and walk away with freedom from whatever that is. I want to show you today how to get there. There is a principle that Jesus taught that allows us to experience this kind of freedom. In fact, today all over the world, there are people celebrating the fact that they believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But the thing that's astounding about this is they're not just celebrating an event 2,000 years ago. Most of these people... Billions claim that Jesus has changed their life now, like that he is still alive changing their lives. But you see, Jesus' way of thinking and his teaching were completely paradoxical to the ordinary way of thinking. They were contradictory to a lot of people and to his culture, and they still are today. His approach is often very different than what we experience in the world. And in fact, I want to hear, I want you to hear a story today of what happened to Jesus in one particular event of his life where people came to meet him during a festival called the Passover Festival. It just happens to be that this is the Passover week as well, which is a Jewish festival that's still celebrated to this day. Christians celebrate now Easter during the Passover week uh, in, in fulfillment of the actual Passover. But 2,000 years ago, this same week, some people came to Jesus to ask him a question. It's in John chapter 12, and let's hear together what the Word of God has to say. It goes like this. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, from, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. And then it says that Philip went and told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. So in case you're wondering what's happening here, first of all, the Greeks were not really where they usually were. So this is Israel. They're in Jerusalem. Most people are Jewish. Jesus attracted all kinds of people to hear him teach. So from in his first century world, people would travel from all over that world to come see what's going on with Jesus. Now, the Greeks represented the irreligious of the day. They were the people that were skeptics often. They were intellectuals and philosophers. They were very wealthy Jesus attracted those people, but they were also the kind of people that said, that's not quite my thing, but I'm curious about Jesus. And maybe you identify with these Greeks. Like you came here today, someone maybe dragged you or whatever, you know, drew drew you to Echo Church, uh, but you're here, you're like, okay, I don't really know about this whole religion thing or about Christianity or about faith, but I am curious about Jesus. That's what the Greeks were doing right here. So they went to Philip, one of Jesus' apprentices, or we call them disciples, and Philip's like, hey, uh, uh, let me go ask Andrew. So we went to Andrew, Andrew was like, can you do this with me? And he was a little bit hesitant. By the way, we all seem to have this kind of friend. It's like when you're hesitant or scared or afraid of something, you're like, I know if I ask that guy or that gal, they'll do it with me. Anyone have a friend like that? Or maybe you're that friend that's like, you, you tell me the adventure, I'm there. Uh, I, mean, I, I had this experience two weeks ago. I was at a, a retreat in Colorado, and it was about 60 people there in this beautiful, hilly area, and they invited us to ride horses. So they said, hey, if you are a beginner, go to this group. If you want to do the intermediate horse riding experience, go to this group. If you want to go to advanced, go to that group. And then they, they continue to tell a story how last year, the advanced people had a blast, but two of them got thrown off their horses because it was so intense and had to be helicoptered into the hospital. And, but I heard the adventure part. I kind of ignored the helicopter part. And I looked at the guy next to me, my friend. I was like, I'll do it if you do it. And he, 
He literally goes, I might need a shot of whiskey before doing that. Uh, and then we talked ourselves into it. Four of us out of 60 went to the, I'm not a horse expert at all. I had done it a few times, but there's something about the thrill. I'm like, I'll, I'll do it if you do it. I, can't, I wouldn't do it alone, but I'll go if you go with me. That's basically what they're doing. I survived, by the way. I didn't get hurt. Thank God. I'm good, good to go for you. Uh, but they went together, and they asked Jesus. Now, you might be wondering, why were they hesitant? See, Jesus was a very unique person. He both cared for children and was gentle and loving and forgiving and embraced people that nobody else wanted to embrace in life, so they had friendship with him. But he also casted out evil spirits out of people, spoke with incredible authority and power, and healed deadly diseases. So they were not only friends of Jesus, they actually had a sense of awe for Jesus. They knew this is not an ordinary person. But the other side of it is that when Jesus came and began teaching, he told the people, hey, we're going to go first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, the non-Jews of the world. And maybe in this occasion, they're like, I don't, is it time? It's kind of like when you start a company and you say, we're going to go local before we go global. And Philip and Andrew, they're like, I don't, I don't, is it okay now to bring the outsiders to Jesus? I don't know. I'll go if you go. I'll do it if you do it. So they went. And then Jesus gives them this odd response. He says, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. What a strange statement when you're bringing your friends to meet Jesus, right? And so Jesus is like, now the time has come. And first of all, that that term, Son of Man, is really important. See, Son of Man was a title used in the prophetic Hebrew scriptures that spoke of the day when there would be one that God would send to the earth that would be the Messiah. He would literally fulfill the promises of God to humanity that someday someone would bridge the way between humans and God again by eliminating the power of sin. And so Jesus in this instance is literally saying, I am fully God, I am fully human. So your fear of me and friendship with me, it's kind of accurate, actually. Like, I am both near and I am other than you. And so he says, the the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory. Like, what I came to do is about to be fulfilled among you in front of your eyes. It's like the climax. Like, when you've been working on a product for a long time and you're about to reveal, that's the time of glory. So they, he, he said this to them. They were probably just staring him down. And then he continues to explain how this time of glory would unfold, but in a way that is also pretty strange and counterintuitive. He says this, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. But if you care nothing for your life in this world, you will keep it for eternity. Anyone, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And my Father will honor anyone who serves me. See, he unfolds to them a counterintuitive approach to finding life. See, he says, maybe you've learned before that death comes after life, but I want to teach you of another principle, that there is a death that leads to life. Death brings life. I wonder if you can say that with me, all of our locations together. One, two, three. Death brings life. This is what Jesus is revealing. And in fact, it's not just in this one instance. This is actually all over the universe. This principle plays itself out. Did you know that scientists have discovered that when a dying star dies, it releases life into our galaxy? So when a supernova happens, for example, when it's a massive star that that explodes into its death, 
That explosion will, will send carbon and oxygen and elements to the atmospheres of the earth, and it brings life to the earth. Death brings life. Some of those stars that don't explode into these massive things, they shrink back down and cool down to black holes as if God was painting a picture for humanity that if you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you die to yourself, you will gain it. There is life after a certain kind of death. This is also true in the animal kingdom. So when a shark is in the water and it's hunting down a fish, that shark will grab the fish and the death of that fish will become life-giving nutrients to that shark. The same is it's true for the eagle. The eagle flying down over the ocean will hunt down a little mini fish that's innocent, but the death of that little fish will become life to the eagle. And what Jesus is saying is this is also so true in agriculture. When your seed is planted in the soil, it goes dormant in a way it dies, but then it cracks open. And out of its death comes a little sprout that will begin to grow and grow and grow. And out of the death of that seed comes an incredible harvest of new life. Death brings life. It's a principle in all of God's creation. And it's there to teach us something. So what do we do at that point? We get the harvest of that seed and we turn it into the foods that bring us life. So us Brazilians, we turn it into the feijoada. You know what I mean? Have you had the feijoada before? You, you guys have not had feijoada. You gotta go have some. Go have some feijoada, it's very good. Maybe you're Hispanic, you're like, no, no, I'll kill the tomato to make me pico de gallo, that's your thing. <laughs> or maybe our Filipino crew here at Echo, you love that adobo chicken, and you gotta kill that chicken in order to bring life to your 150 friends that go to your house later, right? <laughs> we all love the Filipino parties. It's like never ending food, it's like forever. The amount of chickens that die for them is incredible. <laughs> and then uh, maybe you're a vegetarian and I just wanna remind you that apple had to die to bring you life. <laughs> the principle still applies. Here's what Jesus is saying. There's a kind of life that is only experienced after a kind of death. In order to go up, you gotta come down. So the word of God says, humble yourselves before the mighty power of God and at the due time he will lift you up in honor. The way to ascension is through descension. And if you want your life to bear fruit, you have to be able to experience this kind of life I'm talking about. But he's not talking about a literal death. He's talking about a submission, a surrender. See, he says this, those who love their life in this world will lose it. But those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. He's not saying you gotta let go of everything. He's saying our obsession with life in the here and the now needs to die if you wanna experience real life. Look up. There's something incredibly greater than just building your own name, building your own career, and going to work to make the money, to go to sleep, to go to work, to make the money. There is more to life than that. And if you look up and remember, you are an eternal being and your soul has an eternal destination. And if you live in light of eternity, everything changes for you. But you have to surrender. See, life is like a seed. Did you know a coconut is a seed? I didn't even know this this week, uh, before this week. Uh, but coconuts are a seed. And the thing that's interesting is if you hold on to this coconut, you can enjoy just the coconut, but that's all you have. If you hold on to, in fact, I, I didn't know this, this coconut right here, it was actually rotten, and I, I pierced it and I drank it this week. So I drank rotten coconut water, it was nasty. But, but if you hold on to it, that's all you got. But did you know that if you plant this seed of a coconut into the soil, it'll go into its dormant stage that we call the death of the seed, and out of that death comes a little sprout and that sprout will grow up to become a huge palm tree that produces many, many coconuts that bring life to an entire room of people. 
In fact, it'll keep producing over and over and over again. And what Jesus is saying is, if you hold on to your life, that's all you get. You are like a breath, it'll be gone. But if you want your life to count, if you want there to be life that comes out of you, that influences your kids and your friends and your environments, if you want your life to count beyond your generation, you gotta surrender fully to me. You gotta lay it down to me. By the way, it does not grow when you put it on the ground and then you keep picking it back up. I just want to point this out. There's some of us, that's what we like to do. Like, okay, God, I'll give you some of you, oh, but not all of me. But I'll give, but I'll give you some, like, but, uh, but I don't know, not relationships. Like, no, not that, not that person, not the unforgiveness. I'm going to hold on to the unforgiveness in my heart. I'm going to hold on to that bitterness inside of me. But Jesus teaches us a new way. He says, if you want real life, Lay it down. Submit to me. Don't try to control your life. I am way better at that than you. Surrender. Put your desires aside, your obsession with building your own name. Put it aside. My name is much greater than your name. Put aside your obsession with building your own kingdom and building your own possessions. There's more to life than that. Another instance, Jesus said it this way, if, you, if anyone wants to be my follower, give up your own way. Pick up your cross, like willing to die, give it all up. Follow me, if you hang on to your life, you lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will keep it and save it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul. See, so what? We build all kinds of toys in this life, but then we perish and don't keep them. So what? We build ourselves a name while feeling empty inside. So what? We achieve our goals, but then neglect our purpose. So what? We acquire wealth, but then live in poverty of the soul. And so what? We find all kinds of comforts, Go to the best college and build all the stuff that we want and all the cool products. And when you die, you die. That's it. So what if we do all that, but the eternity and the destiny of our souls is not guaranteed to be in life with God? See, Jesus can take the dead parts of our life the shame and the guilt and the addictions and the mistakes and all of that. And he says, look, don't, the answer is not in you. The answer is in him. And if you surrender your life fully to him, then he gives you the strength to change you from the inside out. A life of fruitfulness begins with a posture of brokenness. This is why it says, confess your sins to God so that you may be forgiven. Admit you're broken and you'll find life. Come to me, God says, in all humility, humble yourselves before God and he'll lift you up. This is the life that he designed us to live. I want you to see a story of someone right here at Echo who surrendered her life to Jesus so that he can bring back life into her. Check this out. My name is Dabaita Funakalafi, and I have been with Echo for almost three years. My own life before Jesus was uh, everything I did. It, it was destruction. It was death. It's from the shame. It's from prostitution, from stealing, um, the lies, like all of that brokenness. Uh, there was a time, a point where um, my brokenness was leading me to places where I would cut myself um, because I didn't want to feel the pain. I didn't want to endure that pain. I wanted to feel a different type of pain. Years later, it led to me wanting to end my life. I tried to overdose because of the pain that I was going through during that time. So everything leading up, like, I was not, it was just leading to more destruction. Um, 
And then later on, a couple years later, I ended up losing my brother to suicide. Um, and seeing the ripple effect after that, if I had done that, that would have been selfish of me. It showed me also that I hated what, what, who I am. I hated who I am and what I was going through. I need to find a home base. I, I need to find a home base because I, that's, I knew in my, deep down in my heart, I need it. Um, so then I looked, I, I ended up finding Echo. And so I was like, I'm gonna go there. And so luckily it's down the street for me. Thank you, Lord. He knew the distance was a, um, a, a thing for me that I don't like. Um, so he, yeah, the glory goes to him. Um, and it was the people at the door for me, the greeters. Like, I can't emphasize how much the greeters at the door was a sweet taste of Jesus' love for me. Like, just welcoming me um, with my brokenness, my shame, um, and just everything that I was carrying around with me and let alone hiding it from the world um, and not bringing it out to light so that way he can use it. Uh, Alpha uh, was, a, was the game changer for me. Um, I, I found that in my brokenness, I've always had a father, um, that I was a, a daughter of a king. That's where I found, it started my, my, my journey as who I was and who God intends me and sees me as in, in all my sinful ways and, and brokenness. The community that I was in, um, they walked alongside me, which was a very, um, I'm very thankful for. Um, shout out to online team. Um, I'm very thankful for them. Uh, because it was a sense of God's mercy and grace and His unconditional love um, before my eyes. Um, even like last year from getting baptized to now, I look back and it was crazy. It was crazy, but I made that commitment to go and join small groups. I made that commitment to go and serve. Though my world is crazy, I was like, God, I'm gonna commit myself to doing this. Because why? Because I know the good, loving God and loving Father that you are. Um, through the midst of my background, whatever it is, I, it's, it's already done. It's because of his mercy upon my life, his grace over my life, his unconditional love over my life. It's already been done on the cross, like imperfect. Like the nails that was put through him was for me. The gashes that was given to him was for me. And it's the same for you as well. Um, and Jesus can only do that. Only Jesus can do that for you. Mm. It's beautiful. See, real life begins with our surrender to the one who created it. When we lay our life down, he then takes our surrender and he brings life into it and some of us we've been holding on for quite a while and he's saying let it go let it go let me have your life but i want to narrow in for a minute on the last sentence that jesus said he says anyone who wants to serve me anyone must follow me because my servants must be where I am, and my Father will honor, listen to this, anyone. This is the word that he is highlighting here. Philip, Andrew, Greeks, if you're still wondering if this is just for a few or if it's for you, it's for anyone. Anyone who comes is able to receive this kind of life. If you want to be near to God, the invitation is there. 
And what Jesus is saying with incredible emphasis here is that this is for the entire world. It's for you that come with skeptic hearts, with unbelieving questions. It's for those of us that come not knowing if we really belong in this place. It's for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles, it's for Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and agnostics and atheists and Christians. Jesus invites all people to come to him. This is why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. There is a principle in the universe that says there is a death that brings life. And my time of glory is now. What he's saying is, let my death bring life to you. And this is open to anyone who's willing to receive it. So just as the death of a star breathes life into the atmosphere of the earth, just as the death of an animal brings nutrients to another animal, just like the seed that dies can sprout up to become life-giving harvest for the many, so the Son of Man came to die on the earth that he created. And then he was buried in the dark soil of his own creation. But three days later, out of that dark grave came a crack of light. And Jesus, like the sprout of that flower or that plant out of the Dead Sea, came out of that grave. And then he says, anybody who wants to experience life, follow my example. So come to me. Come to me when you're tired and you're weary and you're broken. Come to me when there's parts of you that are dead that you want to make sure stays in your past. If you come to me and you give me your life like a seed and you surrender it to me, I will take that seed and I will take what's dead inside of you and I will bring it to life. In fact, it will become a harvest. Your life will count beyond just the products you create and the wealth that you acquire. You have an eternal destination. And if you put your faith in what Jesus has done, that his death brings life, then your life will be eternal. That's the invitation. I wonder if you would close your eyes with me for a minute. Because I know there's people here in this room that the, the, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is drawing you. And you know that's you. You know that there's something inside of you that's saying, come to me. That's Jesus calling, and he says, if you just call out on his name, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And all you do, even right now, I want to ask you to do this. If you've never surrendered your life to him and buried the seed of your life in him, say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. I am humbling myself before your almighty power. And I'm asking you to take my submission and bring life. I will turn from my sin and I turn to you. You are the bringer of life. If you pray that prayer from a believing heart, your eternity is guaranteed with God and it's just the beginning. But you know, Jesus says we should pick up our cross every day. And I know there's some people here that you've maybe already made that decision, but you've been kind of halfway in the soil. And God's asking you to make a full surrender to him. Make this Easter a different one for you. Bury the seed in the soil of God's love. Watch what he can do with a fully surrendered self. I want to ask you to locate that little card that you came in with. This card today is a spiritual card. Go ahead and find it. It might be in your chair, the chair next to you. Grab a pen as well, maybe behind your chair, on your chair. I want to ask you to take a minute to write down on this card what God's stirring in you. See, some of you, you made the decision today. You're like, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. There's a second little box here that says, for the first time, I'm giving him all I am. Let me know. We're going to send you some resources for your journey. Others of you, you're like the Pika, and you're exploring faith, and you need to go to Alpha like she did. 
See, Alpha is a 12 or 10 week course that we offer here at Echo. It's a, over dinner, super casual. All of our campuses have it. It's an opportunity for you to address the big questions of life in a loving, caring, safe environment. It starts in May. And if you're kind of curious, you're not ready yet to take that step toward Jesus, it's okay. But I want to encourage you to take it seriously and go attend Alpha for a season and see what God will do in your heart. And then there's a decision that all of us can participate. You notice that box there at the bottom. It says, next week we're starting a new teaching series called Get Out of My Head. And see, all that we believe that are these lies, toxic lies that lead us to a life that is subpar to what God desires for us. There are truths that counter those lies. So we're going to take four weeks to talk about what it looks like to live out a true, honest, real life. And I want to ask you to sow some seeds into your spiritual journey. Maybe you're not used to coming to church every week. Try it for four weeks. Check that box if you're willing to make that commitment with us. And then turn this card over. There's one more step for you. I know that there's, everybody's got at least one thing that God's saying, let it go. You've been holding on really tight to whatever that is. It might be an, a, a forgiving somebody, and you know it's eating you up inside. It might be actually pride that's kept you from submitting yourself to God because I don't know what people will think. I don't know. It might be even some things of your past that you've held on to. Like, God, I'll give you part of my life, but not that part of my life. Would you write it down? What are you letting go of today? And then write down below that. What will you gain? Like, what's your prayer? Like, God, I, I want freedom. Maybe it's one word. I want life. I want peace. I want your promise, God, of joy in my life. Take a minute to write it down even now. We're going to give you a chance to turn these in on your way out today. There are going to be ushers and greeters at the doors. And we're going to pray for every single one of these cards of everybody in our audiences today. But I'm going to pray in just a minute as well for us. But before I do, I want to ask you to do one additional thing if you're a follower of Jesus. See, this Sunday is special for us because... It's not a historical event. It's personal to us. And if you're exploring faith still or you, don't, you have questions, that, you know, you can use this moment to just think about the song and meditate and search your heart. But if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to find that little cup, the communion cup in front of your chairs. And it might be underneath your chairs. Just find that communion cup uh, near where you are. And there's a little flap you're going to open throughout the song. And just at some point throughout the song, open that first little flap that's got a wafer. That little wafer represents the body of Jesus. And as you take that element, let it remind you that his body was broken for you. And then whenever you're ready and you search your heart, peel off the next little layer that's a cup, that's a, a grape juice. That grape juice symbolically represents the blood of Jesus. Drink it throughout this song to remember his blood was shed for you. He did it because he loves you and he invites you into relationship with him. So you can stay seated in the beginning of this song, finish your cards, take your communion, and when you're ready, you can stand with us and sing this song. Father, thank you that you are kind and generous and loving, that you take our submission and our humility and you lift us up and you honor your own creation when we look up to you. So Lord, let us be reminded of the depth of your love as we surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.